Uh, now we are recording. So welcome to this master class on how to create your own training program. This is a subject that is near and dear to me because for many years, I didn't have a training program and it seemed daunting to say the least of how to create one. And now that this is what I do for a living, I would love to break it down for you guys so you have a clear plan of action to accomplish your goals. So I'm gonna go ahead and start my slideshow and um, we'll get started. So I'm gonna share. Okay, here is my slideshow. And how this talk will go tonight is that for the next 40 minutes, I will be discussing training plans, plus an upcoming opportunity for you guys. And then we'll finish with 15 minutes of questions and answers. The questions and answers will come from the chat. So make sure to write down your questions as you have them and you can go ahead and post them in there. All right. So creating your own training plan. The first thing is me, who I am. I am Alex Steiger. I am a coach and climber. I am also a certified personal trainer, a sports performance coach, um, women are not small men course graduate. And I'm a full-time climbing coach through movement folder and training beta. So I do in-person classes as well as remote. And I was a team head coach for seven years and also a group fitness instructor. But more importantly to you guys for this talk is I really like to have a structure for my activities. So at this current time, I have my climbing training plan, a chest training plan, a running training plan, and it is the only way I can stay progressive in my chosen sports and activities. So I wanna break down how to create your own training plan in, in detail, and then also go into several of the things that I see really hold people back. Okay. Why make a training plan? So, it is the best way to give yourself every chance possible to accomplish your goals. I, for one, and I see this happen to a lot of people, is gross errors throughout the year or the month or the week or the day just by not kind of knowing what they need to plan for. So that can look like, um, doing a whole bunch of bouldering with your friends because that's what they're doing and it seems fun, but you do that for the two months before you're supposed to go to the red. And you didn't actually train to sport climb on pumpy endurance routes. And then you get to the red and you're like, oh, I wish I would have. And that is exactly what I hope to eliminate from happening with a good training plan. So it gives you the chance to really look ahead and make sure that you stay on point with your goals and tracking. Okay, the next big one is in order to avoid over or under training. So the key to success is consistent training at the right dosage for you. And if we just leave that up to inspiration, so when we feel good, we do a lot and then we often do too much and then we don't feel good anymore, so we don't do enough. So we end up having these big spikes in activity and then this big decrease where we're failing to be consistent in our training. So over time, we're just not gonna see the results we would see if we had stayed consistent and kind of held ourselves back when we're feeling super motivated, not fully, we have to have fun, but enough that we don't um, have these big cycles in our training and our performance. Also key for injury prevention, because often when we get that high motivated state and we're going to the gym three days in a row, we're trying our project, 
um, two or three times too many, that's um, a big indicator and potential risk for injury. Okay, the third thing I wanted to bring up was in order to free up your brain so that when you show up to the climbing gym, you don't need to be thinking about what to do. You could just focus on showing up ready to um, get done your agenda. Know what you're doing so you don't have to be spontaneous and figure it out in the moment or wait for somebody to come to with an idea. All right, next up. Where to start? So this is where I see and have failed a lot is just not knowing how to actually initiate a training plan. I know I need one, but what next? The first thing that is key is you have to figure out what your goals are. And in a second here, I'll share a very general goal worksheet to help figure that out. But you need to know what you're actually training for and breaking that down into really concrete things to help you overcome your hurdles. Also knowing that consistency is key. So through my goal worksheet, I wanna figure out what are the things that need to happen for me to have every opportunity to meet my goals and what are my biggest hurdles? And then how can I factor that into my training plan? I'll show you what that looks like here in just a second. Next up is to write out your month by month general plan. Oh, and if you're a note taker and you're worried about this, I will be sending you this slide, the complete slide, plus a sample plan. So don't worry about it. Just take notes on what I'm saying. You don't need to copy down the slide. So the month by month general plan is really important. And I will also be showing you exactly what that looks like here in just a second. The third thing, decide which training plan platform works best for you. I have seen them all. You can have a training plan in so many different ways. I get my running plan texted to me, ironically enough. I um, used Google calendars, pen and paper calendar, Excel sheets. Most often now I use a training plan app because I really like it for recording my sessions and being able to look back plan ahead and also have it alert me that I'm supposed to do something so that um, that next I know to prepare for it. But there are many ways that you can create your training plan. I recommend choosing something that is simple and is something you use frequently. So I, yeah, if you can make sure to even have blips into your regular calendar that you use every day just so you know what's coming. And if you have specific questions about that, make sure to ask in the Q&A. All right, skeleton or detailed? So in my mind, there are two main kinds of training plans. You have a very brief general one that tells you, I am climbing and training on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday. That is skeleton. So you know you're doing something, so you schedule that into your calendar. At the bare minimum, if you care about progressing in your sport, I recommend that. That way you don't um, miss out on your training. They take priority in your schedule, so you know um, if you missed one, that you can make it up and when. But bare bones, just that information. Super detailed programming is awesome too. I'm not a, I'm not somebody who thinks one is way better than the other. And at different times of the year, I'll use different kinds of programming for myself or for my clients. So um, super detailed can be down to what you're doing in your warm up, what you're doing the first hour of your session, what specific exercises are you doing for your training, what are the progressions, at what weight, that kind of deal. So at least like one to two months of my year, I like it to be detailed. And then when I'm performing or just kind of day to day, I like it to be more general. Okay. 
here is the goal setting worksheet. So I'm going to send this to you. So you'll get an email with a couple additional resources post our talk. But basically, what is the goal? What are three things that would help me accomplish my goal? Examples could be increasing my finger strength, overall fitness, and working on fear of falling. So I would write those three things down. I'm gonna to toss in another one because I see this one be a hurdle for a lot of people is um, climbing partners, having somebody to go to my project with. How can I work on those three things consistently two to three times per week? So that's where I would just sit down for a second, look at my three things and be like, okay, I can work on my finger strength. I'll have one bouldering session a week where I work on um, fingery boulders. I'll have one hangboard session per week. And that will be the two times I really focus on getting my finger strength up. I might then say, okay, fear of falling needs to be at least a two times a week thing. So I'll have one day where I'm outside and I'm gonna take practice falls on my warm ups. Another day in the gym, I'll take practice falls on project level routes. So I'm trying hard in falls. That's just an example, but I wanna get you that picture. And then, what are the biggest hurdles to completing my goal? And this question, you need to be pretty honest with yourself. And it could be something as simple as um, getting discouraged when I don't make progress. Okay, cool. So you need to make measurable goals to stay motivated and seeing that you're making accomplishments or um, spending enough time on my project. Those kind of things, as well as um, work stress, any, yeah, anything that can really prevent you from showing up to the gym, being ready to train, or preventing you from accomplishing your project, I think it's really important to actually think about it. So write it down, think about it, plan for it. And then why do I want to complete this goal is just a great mindset question because hopefully we're on all on a pursuit of mastery. And I keep coming back to this when um, I'm doing my check-ins with myself. How is it coming? Why do I want to do this? How is it going to help me for future things? And how will it make me happier? Okay. Next up. Let's see here. Aha, uh -huh, here it is. Okay, when I say the month, general month plan, this is what I mean. And this will be in the template I send you, not filled out. So this is where I start for every year. Here is my general 2020 general plan. This is my bread and butter before I dive in and get into any more details in my training plans. I want to look at the big picture for the year. And I'm gonna talk more on the difference between being in a training and a performance block here coming up, but I'm going to write that out here. So additionally, I'm gonna add in a little bit of details and I'm gonna put my top three goals of the year, just as a reminder. Um, tip, write down your goals everywhere. The more you see them every day, the more likely you are to go to your training sessions and show up and get the work done. So here you can see it's January, February, all the way down. I marked in January, I wanna be training, February performance, March performance, April training, May training, June performance, training, training, performance, 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 rest and recovery. It doesn't mean because I only have rest and recovery in December, that's, that is the only month that I prioritize rest and recovery but I'm gonna add in weeks here and there. And just by doing this, you can get that bigger picture of what you want your year to look like. You can even start planning your flight tickets, your climbing partners, your um, how your whole training plan should be structured on a very macro scale. Okay, moving on. Key points for success. 
So the best training plans are simple and realistic. And realistic can be very difficult. When I started writing training plans for people, for clients, often I would find that they were very um, ambitious, too ambitious, and even more ambitious when I'd write plans for myself. So I've had to really learn to write down the minimum, leave room for how inspired you feel. So write, yeah, stick, keep it simple. Simple is the best. If it can't fit on your calendar, at least a blurb of it, it's probably a little too complicated. So leave room to be flexible. And this goes along with what I was just saying. So you may or may not show up to the gym feeling ready to give it your all or complete a big workout. So make sure you know in your plans how you can adjust for um, to still get your priorities taken care of. But um, yeah, be flexible. If everything is really strict, you're going to set yourself up for failure. It's really hard to accomplish 10 items a session. It's way easier to accomplish three. So next up is plan your rest and recovery time. And as a general rule of thumb, I like to schedule a deload week for clients and myself every three to six weeks. It varies on the varies on the individual and where they're at in their training in their year. But for a deload week, I'm gonna think of just, A, you can just completely take a week off. That's okay. Taking off time is an awesome thing. But, or, or yeah, or just lower it down. I like to think of 50%. So if I normally do a two hour session on Tuesdays, I'm gonna do a one hour session. Or if I normally climb six routes, I'm gonna climb three. So 50% of what normal is, I reduce, yep, is my deload week. Okay, know your priorities. So that comes down to that goal worksheet and those three things that you decide are the three biggest factors holding you back. I recommend always thinking of them and making sure that they're being met. By knowing what your priorities are, you can also be more flexible because if you don't feel like doing everything you thought of doing, you can just focus on that one thing that is that criteria for your priority. Okay, oops. Five, put your sessions in your calendar. And I really recommend doing this in advance. I work with a lot of busy people who are very consistent in their training. And the only way they're able to do that is by scheduling in the sessions, which brings up a point that I really wanna talk about, which is when to schedule your sessions. Not everybody can go whenever, but know that if you're in a performance block, um, I want those sessions to be longer with friends. You have minimal time trying really hard, maximum time resting, visiting, things like that. Try and schedule some sessions that's just for you at a focused time where you're not tired or the gym is super busy, if at all possible. Even a lunch hour or an early morning hour can be incredibly productive. So know that when you're scheduling your sessions in a calendar, they don't all have to be at one time. Even if you're busy, there's usually a place that a 30 to 30 minute to an hour session can go. All right, the final thing here is have a year plan. So have that general plan. Have a three month kind of layout, like idea, and then have a more detailed two to four weeks of planning. And that two to four weeks I think is really important because that gives you structure and it allows you to be progressive in your programming. Programming is what goes into the training plan. And I'll be talking about that more here in a little bit, but I don't like to be detailed in programming for three months because it doesn't leave you any room to be flexible and to adjust for where you're at. 
but two to four weeks is a great um, place to start for being pretty detailed. Okay, need to know information. So when I sit down with a client and we are about to make their training plan, the first thing I want to establish is how many days a week should they be climbing versus resting? So let's say this is coming up performance versus training, but there, or you are in a performance block, I'm gonna say you should be climbing three to four days a week and having two full rest days. So that's where I start, just getting the days of the week right. And the number one fix I like to make for everybody I work with is getting that number where it should be. So it's really hard to expect progress if you're only doing something one to two days a week. If you're really trying to um, progress in your sport, I recommend three to four days a week. If you are on maintenance mode, that's one to two days a week. So kind of knowing where you're at in your year and then prioritizing just that basic thing can be one of the biggest um, biggest elements of you meeting your goals and progressing. So how many times per week should you be training certain things? So this is the next step. And I actually just write this down. So I want to have two days a week where I'm doing max effort on roots or boulders. I wanna have one day a week of doing volume. I wanna have one day a week of skill work. I wanna hang board once a week. I want a campus, maybe once a week if you're an advanced climber. I want to do my shoulders twice a week, legs once or twice a week, and I want to do plyometrics once a week. Okay, so that might sound like a lot, but when I write out those numbers and I just make a list and I write down how many times I want somebody to do certain things, and that varies person to person and where you're at, but um, I'm going to make sure I fit those things in. And almost all, a lot of these things can be stacked together. So it's not as intimidating as you may think. And then finally, what are your biggest weaknesses so that you make sure to have them be a priority? If you don't know what those are, um, I highly recommend video analysis. So taking video of yourself climbing looking at it, asking friends, maybe getting a coach to do an assessment. Um, it goes a really long way for knowing what should go into your programming. All right, consistency is key. So the base amount of times I like to do something. So let's say I am hangboarding and I'm doing a certain protocol. I want to do that protocol at least eight times before I start doing another protocol or switching it up or maybe stopping hangboarding and starting to campus, something like that. I want eight times. And that number is actually pretty low. There are trainers out there who would say at least 15 to 20 times, which is awesome because consistency is key. But in my programming, I like to think of eight times as a minimum. So that in my training plan is one of the biggest things that I'm trying to make sure happens. So that goes for skill and technique work as well. So if I work on using my thumbs on every hold, let's say I have a habit of only using my fingers and I don't find a place for my thumb and I wanna improve that, I'm going to count out eight different days that I'm climbing and in my warm up, I'm gonna make sure to use my thumbs and I'm gonna have it be eight times. And then I'll do an assessment to see if I need to keep working on it or I could switch to something else. But I see so many people all the time do amazing things for their climbing. They just don't do it enough times to see results. Second thing, record your progress. I like to do assessments every four weeks minimum. And that's so that you can get a good baseline of where you're at and to know that you're progressing and your training plan is working. 
and vice versa. If you're not progressing, you need to make a change so that you can see progress. And um, I can't stress enough how important it is not to just do the same thing over and over. I see this the most with core workouts. I'll see um, many people just, and I used to do this too. I did six minute abs after every climbing session. It was the same exercises in the same minute. So first minute would be elbow plank. Second minute would be sit-ups then row sit-ups, then bicycles, then straight arm plank, et cetera, every time. And unfortunately, that's just not how we make adaptations for our sport and progress. So um, yeah, make sure when I say do something eight times, it means keep that area of focus eight times, but it should still be progressive. All right, follow a similar session outline whenever possible. What I mean by that is um, this is what's gonna help my training plan be really simple and precise is if I don't need to do a big write-up for what the warm-up is gonna be or what's coming next in order of operations. So a general flow I really like is warm-up, body and climbing, focused work. So know the theme of your session, are you, in a, are you performing this session? Are you executing trying hard? Or are you training something specific like um, lock-offs? And I wanna be finding climbs to work on my lock-off strength or maybe underclings, something like that specific. Am I training strength, power, volume? Know what the theme of your session is because so often um, our plans might be forced to change. Maybe you plan on doing deadlifts, but um, there is somebody at the, with the only bar in the gym and it looks like they're gonna be there for a long time. So know that you're doing a hinge movement and have an alternative. Or if you are planning on, um, projecting on routes and your climbing partner bails, have an alternative so that you boulder, but you're still projecting on boulders. Um, a key for that is to do doubles on boulders. So do two boulders in a row and try and have your second one feel really hard, difficult to where you're falling off. So you're kind of still staying true to what your original plan was. Okay, supplemental training. 75, 25 rule. So 75% of your time should be very sport specific. Climbing shoes on, 25% upstairs in the gym. And I even think um, that can be kind of a large percentage. Spend as much time being specific training for your sport as possible. Use a training plan to really make sure this doesn't turn into 50-50. It's so easy to think all of our answers are by getting stronger. Fortunately, in climbing, it's often moving better and developing skill sets. Maybe it's fear of falling that's really holding you back, not um, how much you can bench press. So make sure to use your training plan to stay focused and on track with those percentages. Finally, cool down, assess what went well, what didn't. I'm gonna talk about that a little more coming up. So moving forward, speeding through here. Okay, finally, what I've been alluding to, performance versus training. So it's really important to know whether you're in a performance block or a training block. And those things can be hard to figure out and elusive. So I wanted to simplify it a little bit. Performance is when I'm trying to send a project or I'm trying to um, kind of push my grades. I'm trying to go from B5s to B6s or I have a bouldering project or a sport climbing that I really care about and I'm planning on red pointing it or I am red pointing it. 
I'm going to call that my performance block. My training block is when I'm preparing for my performance blocks and I'm focusing more on strength and conditioning and just, um, yeah, preparing. So performance, I'm really going to think three to four climbing days per week. And if I get really close to sending something, I'm gonna do three. So one day a week, it's always going to be optional. And I'll ask myself how I feel because I wanna prioritize feeling really fresh before I get on my project. And to do that, I'm gonna rest at least two rest days per week and full rest days. So not active rest days or, you know, fitting in power yoga plus a 30 minute gym session plus a three mile jog. That is not a full rest day. So when I'm performing, I'm gonna make sure I'm fully resting and often more than one in a row before I get on my project. My strength and conditioning is in maintenance mode. So key to understand is that it takes about a third of the effort to maintain something as it does to progress it. So if I normally do deadlifts and bench presses two times a week or three times a week, I'm only going to do them once. And I might even um, lower down my total number of sets. So instead of doing five to six sets, I'm only going to do two or three. I'm just keeping that movement up, but I'm not trying to make progress. Same with hangboarding, especially where, yes, that's something I might do two times a week when I'm training. I will definitely only do that once a week if I'm performing. Okay, prioritize feeling motivated and inspired. So that's where I want to go to the gym, being really excited to be there, try hard or show up to my project, not overtrain. So if I need to take three days off before I go get on my project again, because I was feeling run down, I'm not going to bat an eye about it. I'm going to be very um, happy to do that. So that's going to be the priority. My sessions will generally be a little longer in a performance mode because I will be um, taking lots of rest in between max efforts. Okay, um, so between one and a half to three hours for that performance mode. Training, on the other hand, I'm going to be um, aiming towards four days a week. And if I don't feel up to it, three is fine. Um, and I'm gonna say claim climbing training days per week I like to combine them. And I'm gonna try and get at least one full rest day per week plus one to two active rest days. So that's where I'll do my yoga and I'll do my runs. Um, I wanna make sure I'm feeling recovered enough to really show up for my sessions and make gains, but I'm also not trying to be as fresh as I would need to be to send a max level project. When possible, I'm gonna have an every other day schedule. And this has served me very, very well because that way I feel like I'm making progress every time I train versus um, having one good day the first day and then one subpar the second day on and then maybe rest a day, climb two days. That's not generally the schedule I like to have when training. Oftentimes that's the schedule I end up in, in performance just from if you're a weekend warrior and you travel to a climbing area and you might be there for two days or you only have Saturday, Sunday off, you might need to be climbing those two days in a row and that's okay. But um, when I'm training, I try and stick to every other day. Strength and conditioning two to three times per week. I'm going to um, pick two to three focuses that I'm trying to improve. So maybe it's my finger strength, my shoulder strength, and um, I want to get my barbell squat progressed. So I'd pick those two to three things and I would focus on them that two to three times per week. I'm going to prioritize showing up and getting the work done. So I don't necessarily need to be as motivated and inspired as I do in the performance. I really want to make sure um, to stay focused on just, um, yeah, checking the boxes, not necessarily just taking three days off because I feel like it, but um, maybe bargaining with myself and doing uh, more of a deload session, but still showing up. 
So it's also a great time to do other activities you enjoy. So I like running. I definitely try and progress my sprinting when I'm in a training block and I stop sprinting or switch it to maintenance once a week when I'm in my performance block. So these sessions can be really short and my training sessions are a great time to socialize, but most of the time I'm just trying to stay focused, get them done. If socializing can happen too, that's great, but I'll go and I'll do a 30 minute session by myself in the gym or up to two hours. Short and sweet, get it done, recover for your next one. Okay. Here is a sample week. So the top week you see is a sample um, training week for me. And the bottom week is a sample projecting week. So Monday is usually always my rest day. Tuesday, tomorrow, I have a run in the morning. And in the evening, I'm going to go to the climbing gym. I'm going to have a kilter board session, do my campus workout, and a short core workout. And this is my personal program. I just updated this, but this is what it looks like pretty much for the next month. So Wednesday will be a rest day. Thursday, I'll be projecting on gym routes and in the evening or right after my session, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm gonna do a short hangboard workout, pull-up workout, deadlift and bench press. So, and that can be whatever protocol you're on. I'll be doing some weighted pull-ups. And Friday, I'll be sprinting, but I don't know what I'm doing, but you could see that outline. Saturday, I'll be climbing outside. I don't know where I'm going yet, but I will hopefully be um, trying to quick send something. So um, something of a grade that I can just try and do. Sunday is optional climbing, depending on how I feel or what happens Saturday. And at the very minimum, I want to do a short strength circuit with some hangboarding so that I make sure to get the number of things I wanted to get done, done. So I wanted to get done two core workouts this week. So I have core here and here. So Sunday and Tuesday, I wanted to get done two finger training sessions this week. So Thursday and Sunday. And um, I'm trying to campus once a week, and this will be my third time campusing. So I'll have at least five more to go before I stop campusing regularly or I assess where it's at. Okay. Oops. Now for the performance week, um, you can see here that there's two rest days in a row projecting, and I'm not going to have that core necessarily two times a week. I'm gonna try and hangboard once a week. This bouldering day is optional because if I come back from my project and I'm really tired, I might rest Monday, Tuesday, have one training session on Wednesday, rest Thursday, Friday, climb Saturday, Sunday. So if I was to stick with this schedule year round, I would definitely get weaker, but because it's designed into my training program, I have my training box, and then I have where I'm maintaining my training, but I'm really focusing on being recovered enough for max level efforts to try and send my projects. So I hope that helps clear things up a little bit. Moving on, final topic, how to structure your sessions. So I talked about this a little bit, but try and have this be the same. So warm up, and this is where I really wanna focus on technique and skill. And I'm going to use that same hashtag system. I'm going to focus on one technique. So if I'm working on, um, let's say, climbing in, um, let's say I'm working on drop knees. I'm going to focus on finding good drop knees in my warm up for a minimum of eight sessions before maybe I switch to heel hooks, something like that. Boulders, don't forget skill work and volume. You still need to do that. So make sure to be in your training plan, schedule in time for some three by threes or do as many of a flash grade as you can in 20 minutes, things like that to still get your volume because it can be easy just to focus on um, short attempts and trying hard. 
sport climbers, don't forget to try hard and to fail plenty. It can be easy to just start clipping chains all the time and not necessarily falling on projects and trying max level moves for you. So make sure in your plan to schedule that time in. Even if you don't really like bouldering, you could just make a finish halfway up the wall and try hard or get on something harder for you on top rope if you're worried about falling and get those hard moves in, try, think about four to eight moves max before you fall off. Add in a cool down. Even if it's just 10 to 15 minutes of stretching or PT exercises that you should be doing, I highly recommend doing that and then recording three things that went well and three things that could have been improved. If I'm really focused on improving at the moment, I'm gonna do this after every session. In general, this is something I like to ask myself at the end of every week. What went well this week in my training plan and what can be improved? So just that can help you become an expert at creating your own training plan. Now, here is three sample um, workouts. So I have, I'm checking here, how to warm up. And you'll get this slideshow, so you don't need to um, copy these or figure that out. But I just did a sample training plan of my warm up. So when I say normal warm up, I mean this. And I did a sample projecting plus weakness session in here. So one hour of focused projecting. And then B, also do this weakness time. Finish your final 20 minutes of climbing by picking a couple full number grade lower down than what your flash grade is. So easier for you. Um, climbs, that is your weakness and complete a couple of them. And then a short accessory workout. So a small hangboard workout, split squats, core times five. This is how I like to structure my sessions. Um, and this is the detailed version for you all out there because it's easier to learn with detail and then go to that super simple. And here's a sample bouldering drill of pick a grade that is slightly above flash grade and try it with open feet and then followed up by three climbs of cut feet. So every two moves, I cut my feet, I put them back on, and then two climbs of three second hovers so that you're making sure to get in skill and strength workout on the wall into your sessions. And then I'll finish with a short kettlebell workout. Okay. Next up. Oh, hold on here. There we go. The most common mistakes that I see people making are they plan on doing way too much. Keep it simple. Not scheduling sessions in the calendar, not scheduling fun slash do what you want days. Our sport is fun. You have to make sure you're having fun and that you're not a um, dictator to yourself, but that you are a good coach so that you're asking yourself what you want to do regularly instead of just telling yourself what to do, I think is really important. And I, I try and have a fun do what I want day every week. So make sure to add that in. And you can end up having a two and a half hour super productive session where you do a lot of things, if that's what you felt like, or maybe you stay on the couch and watch Netflix, that's totally fine too. So the last mistake that I see really often is what I had already talked about of not knowing the theme of the session and how to adjust for unexpected changes. So definitely try and have some plan Bs and just briefly think about that, especially if you're a sport climber and your sessions depend on somebody else. Okay, that segues me into very briefly talking about an upcoming opportunity I have. The way that I learned how to do training plans was by having a coach do one for me. That really got me rolling. So I will be doing that. And I have a small group
coaching opportunity coming up. And it will be six weeks where you'll get an individualized training program. Why group is because I feel that so many people, adults especially, don't have the opportunity to learn in a like-minded um, small group of similar level people to learn from as well as from a coach. Team kids have this at about every gym in the country, but adults, it's a bit harder to find. So that's my goal with this program. So what you'll get is a six weeks training plan, individual programming call, one-on-one, -on -one, weekly team meeting, so an hour talk every week, and, um, and then anytime question and answering. There will be two groups, and I wanted to mention this to you guys because we're opening up the enrollment and I expect that they'll fill up fast. So there will be an intermediate and an advanced, and it'll be max 12 people. So if you're interested, please um, click, I'm gonna send, or Neely will put the link to enroll into the sales page in the chat. You can also email me if you have any questions about the program at alex at trainingbeta.com. Okay, cool. So now on to some questions and answers. Give me just a second to get out of my slides. Okay. All right, here we go. I could see Zoom again. Oh, perfect. Neely did put the link, so it's in there. And let me start finding well, some questions. Um, oh, real quick. Hey, David, do you mind turning off your video? Hi. <laughs> Thanks. We just. Cool. Oh, perfect. Okay. So thank you everybody for listening to that lecture. I hope it was really helpful. And um, the first question is, um, what type of regular assessments do you do, physical or technical? How do you assess that the technical is improving? Ooh, I love this question. So there's something that was told to me pretty recently that really helped me assess where I'm progressing in my technical elements. And that's just understanding how we learn um, kind of in general, which is um, unconsciously incompetent. So we don't know that we're doing it wrong. And then next up is we become consciously incompetent. So we know when we're not doing it right and then we become consciously competent so we have to think really hard but we could do it right and then only then do we get to be unconsciously competent where you don't have to think about it anymore but you're integrating that skill into your climbing so when i'm asking myself if a technical area that i'm working on is improving i'm going to see where i'm at in that scale and then know that i need to prioritize it and practice it at least two to three times a week so let's say I am working on clipping more with my left hand. I'm starting to recognize when I'm only clipping with my right, but maybe, but I have to think really hard about um, actually clipping with my left. Therefore, I still need to be really working on it. Okay, regular assessments I do for physical stuff is hangboarding, um, I like to do time sessions, circuits on a board that's always the same. So a spray wall that's always the same or a kilter board, something of that sort. I often do V-point races in the gym to kind of know where my endurance is at. So I'll see how many V-points I can do in 30 minutes, see where, where that's at. Um, I try not to have my assessments be based on grade. Okay. Um, that is also something that we'll, I'll be diving deep into in the team programs or and do regularly with people. So definitely reach out if you want more information on that. Okay. 
across a season of three months, how would you structure a general plan for progression for a client? 30 years intermediate skill level, two years experience focused on bouldering and on another on sport climbing. So I would say um, for bouldering and intermediate skill, 80 to 90% of your time should be on the wall with shoes. So making sure that each session doesn't have to be that different from each other, but that you have it be progressive and that you're not getting lost in supplemental training for climbing. I really recommend focusing even on developing strength on the wall. So if I need to work on lock-off strength, I don't want you to go up to a bar and work on lock-offs. I want you to do hovers where you pause before grabbing a hold for three to five seconds so that you're spending a lot of time on the wall. I would also say, make sure to have lots of technique activities built into your training plan. So look up climbing drills and make sure to add that in maybe twice a week for 30 minutes. Okay, I hope that helps there. And is there a way to get in volume during a sport climbing session without doing doubles, triples? I don't have a partner that I could do this with. Yes, absolutely. Um, you can, one, um, shorten down your rest time a little bit. So I really like to do singles, but I will repeat climbs that I've already done so that I'll get pumped in a shorter period of time and then um, just shorten down the rest. So if you normally would rest 15 to 20 minutes, try and rest um, 10 minutes and up the level a little bit because even just um, one, well, yeah, maybe one, three to six harder moves can make something way more um, kind of in, of an endurance challenge. So I will even um, start a harder boulder and then, or a harder route and then transition to an easier route so I can get that desired pump level. But there's definitely lots of ways to do volume without just climbing a lot. Okay. Yep. And during a deload week in which you are doing 50% of your regular volume, what should the intensity be? Same as your full, full sessions or do you take it down a notch? So that really depends on how my body's feeling, but I usually um, keep the intensity the same. I am all about higher intensity and shorter volume. And when I need rest, I like to first lower the volume down, but not the intensity because I feel like that keeps me kind of primed and ready to um, get back into it. But I just, so usually I just shorten down my sessions. So I can go bolder whatever I want in my deload week. But if I normally have an hour and a half, I only have 45 minutes and I still have to warm up. So I have a very short period of time, but I try and keep the intensity up there. Okay, you mentioned skill work. What is an example of what that is? So I like to think of skill work as anything technical with your climbing. So let's say working on turning your right hip into the wall before you move right hand. That's going to be some mindful skill work that I might make into a drill. Um, something else is just working on my tempo. So am I pausing a lot, especially if the moves get kind of challenging for me or I'm flashing something, or do I have a nice rhythm to my climbing? Are you breathing? Are you using um, just your toes or using your whole foot when you use a foothold? Um, there are so many things there. And um, I recommend if you need ideas, search YouTube or reach out to me and I can give you a list, but anything technical. Okay. Um, What does training look like for two sport athletes, running and climbing? Awesome. So that to me looks like running and climbing. 
in my training blocks, but in my performance block, I'm really going to dial back the one that isn't priority to me. So kind of choosing times where they each get to be in the spotlight and also knowing that um, running long and slow three times a week is probably not going to be what complements your climbing the most or actually helps you progress as a runner, but that you can, um, by shortening those sessions and intensities and adding in the variety, just like in your climbing training, they can complement each other a little better. And the third thing there um, is I like to stack my days if possible, or even try and run in the morning if I'm gonna be climbing the following evening so that I um, still keep my rest days because running can definitely cross you over the line of recovering and it's an active training day and you never touch the wall and then you're still going to be tired for your next session. So um, yeah, I often do a small run in the morning, climb in the afternoon, or try and separate it by um, as many hours as I can. Also keep in mind what running might do that you need to change in your climbing to prevent injury. So if you do a long run, definitely don't go take big falls in the bouldering area. Maybe have it be a half wall day where you just make the finish of every boulder halfway up the wall because your stabilizers and your legs are probably tired. Or if your hamstrings are really tight from running, make sure to do extra warm-ups and maybe avoid um, heel hooks that day. Okay, I hope that helps. And what is the difference between volume and endurance? So great question. They are very similar. I like to think of um, endurance as a term I'm trying to use a little less of because I think it's really icing on the cake and it's something that people tend to do a lot uh, too much of, which is easy climbing for a long time. So just like lower intensity, but for a long duration where volume can be um, moderate to challenging, even high level intensity, but more as a workload capacity. So how much of that can I do in a session? Okay, I hope that helps. It's a bit of a complicated one, but that's the way I look at it. And um, you could probably find different answers from different people. But, um, ooh, what does a weekend project climbing session during a training block look like? So if I'm projecting something and I'm not close to red pointing it yet, I'm still trying, I'm still probably gonna try and be more in a training block cycle. But when I start to get close to sending, I definitely want to switch to that performance block. So um, just because I start getting on my project doesn't mean I'm in a performance block per se, but when I start getting to like two hangs, maybe even three hangs or one hangs, I'm definitely going to start prioritizing really good quality rest before and after those sessions. Is it better to do heavy deadlifts at the beginning of a session? I would say, depending on the session, but no, because I don't like to be fatigued before I do uncontrolled movements. So deadlift is a very controlled movement and, um, and it can create a lot of neurological fatigue, which can mean that maybe you don't react as fast. And I want my reaction times to be really good for my uncontrolled movements, which is climbing, one, to prevent injury, but two, to also be able to be fresh enough to climb with good technique and make progress on my projects. Um, okay, final couple questions here. Do you have any favorite exercises for building lock-off strength or pulling from extended positions? So building lock-off strength, my favorite exercise hands down is three to five second hovers. And doing that on slightly overhanging or varying angle climbs so that you're also working on technique. So you're working on the skill component as well as the strength component. And that's where you just pull into the wall. Like if you're going to your hold, you're just going to stop your hand and hover it there. So you have to lock off with the arm that's still holding you on. 
for three to five seconds before you grab that hold. The other lock off exercise I really like is um, on a bar with two or one hand in a set position. And for five seconds on, 10 seconds off times three, rest three minutes. And I do that a few times. Uh, okay, so I hope you had a pen and paper for that one. But pulling from extended positions, I think key is scaling it down so that you can do it and then progressing. So I love working on that particular thing on an adjustable board, if at all possible, because I'll do a big move, let's say with the board at 25 degrees, and then I'll make it a couple degrees steeper and I'll see if I can do that same move with it being steeper. You can do that in the gym on any wall. You just have to be a little more creative and maybe um, use a worse foot or something of that sort. So yeah, make them up, find, be creative and find those moves and positions that you can scale. Okay, last question here. Um, depending on your training schedule and just life in general, how should you structure your schedule if you need to shift two climbing days in a row or just pick up where the next climbing day picks up? Awesome. So this one, really depends, but my number one priority is accomplishing a certain number of climbing days per week. So if I have to do two in a row, I'm going to do that if it meant I would maybe only climb two days that week. So if I only had three days I can climb that week and then one got messed up, I'll definitely choose to climb two in a row so that I can then rest and then climb um, one other time because that's going to make a big difference. I will be flexible in what that second day on looks like. I won't try and like tack on two really um, similar sessions two days in a row. I'll try and do my power strength day on day one and then volume endurance and some skill work on day two. Okay, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna squeeze in one more from Amy. If you only have two days to train a week, are there more important areas to focus on than others in general? Climbing prioritize climbing. So I would say um, executing and just projecting in the gym. I see so many people just not get on hard enough things to challenge them and progress. So making sure still try and have a project that you look forward to going in and trying to do. And then if you can try and supplement in a hangboard, like one or two hangboards sessions per week so that you're still doing something climbing specific, um, three to four days a week. Cool. Okay. Thank you all so much. And yeah, thank you so much. I just want to let you know to send me an email, alex at trainingbeta.com if you have any questions about that upcoming program. And I can't wait for the next master class that hopefully will be coming up soon. So yep. Have a great evening and I hope to see you all again. Oh, thank you for all the thank yous. <laughs>